Uh, hello again after the break. Here uh, next on the stage is uh, Nikolai Stanchev, uh, who is a student in Sofia University. He is also a teaching assistant in the Sofia University uh, and also an uh, intern in VMware. Uh, Nikolai will tell us about one of the projects he works uh, on in VMware, which is in the field of uh, Internet of Things. Nikki, you are. Hello guys, um, it's a pleasure to be here and, um, and thankful for the, to the organ organizers for um, having me. Uh, so my talk today is entitled AJX Microservices at the Edge. Um, it's an IoT talk that um, will basically um, present to you some of IoT's current challenges and uh, what solutions uh, there are, especially in the open source field. Uh, we're going to take a look at the at AJAX Foundry, which is one solution that I'm working on um, currently at VMware. Um, I'm going to also explain to you in more detail about the structure of the project. And we're going to look into how uh, the microservices that we're using um, are actually handled in the context of the edge. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm an intern at uh, VMware's Open Source Technology Center. Um, I've been there for six months uh, now, and I'm also a student and teaching assistant at Sofia University. Um, so edge computing, um, as all of you know, uh, we're seeing and we're reading in the news about more and more uh, smart devices uh, and sensors. Uh, and this is coined as the fourth industrial revolution even, and it's considered the next big market and next big step in information technology. Uh, so what do all of these devices have in common? Well, all of them are able to generate a vast amount of data over a short period amount of time. Um, to handle this data, uh, in the past, people would normally turn to cloud computing. Uh, and in fact, we can make all these devices send their data to the cloud and get processed there and receive some response based on that data. Uh, but this has all sorts of problems. Uh, first of all, there's a physical distance between the cloud and the devices. This means that um, you're going to have high latency, which in some situations, especially industrial um, cases, is far from ideal. Um, more than that, you're going to have all this unfiltered device-generated data that's constantly being sent to the cloud, which means that you're going to have um, high bandwidth. And of course, like this is not going to be the most cost-effective way to handle things. So that's why uh, we need another solution. And um, years ago, people came to the conclusion that we would need something between the cloud <coughs> and the devices. Um, now, on this slide, uh, it looks like it's in the middle, but actually, this box, which is actually called the edge, and it's the edge device, is in reality far closer than the devices and the sensors than to the cloud. Uh, so in, in this edge, we would need to have uh, things like um, a database for local persistence of data. Uh, we would need some functionality to export the data to the cloud and also receive some commands from the cloud. Uh, we'll need some analytics and some rules engine to um, be able to separate the data that we want to send to the cloud and the data that we think it's not necessary and we can ignore or just store locally. Uh, or actually, it's even possible to, uh, if we lose network connectivity for some reason, we can uh, like store this data in the edge. And the moment we get network connectivity, we can then send it to the cloud. Uh, another thing is uh, things like alerts and notifications uh, coming from all these devices and uh, sensors. And of course, we need to handle security somehow in this context. Um, so here's a picture that tries to illustri illustrate um, the scope of edge computing. Um, as you can see, like, we have the devices on the left. Uh, next to them is the first line of, of device. Uh, I mean, devices and sensors. And next to them is the first line of uh, devices, uh, like edge devices. Um, they are the closest to the, to the sensors. 
Um, and we could have several additional layers of, uh, of other devices before we even turn to the cloud. This is referred to as fog computing. But since this is a very new field, uh, it's a bit unclear where the boundaries are exactly and uh, what is considered an edge device, what is consider considered a fog uh, computing device. Uh, and we're seeing more and more that um, uh, more and more computing power is uh, being put on these edge devices. So have in mind that this is a dynamic field. Um, so what are the challenges uh, currently in IoT? So we have, I have created uh, four categories. The first one is uh, domain expertise, meaning that all the things that I showed you, like databases, uh, security, analytics, uh, these are things that um, are a separate thing in, a, in and out of themselves. So um, like somebody who just wants to implement an IoT solution shouldn't be expected to do this from scratch, so he needs to utilize some new, uh, I mean, some ready project. Uh, also, there's the problem of connectivity, uh, which means that there are a lot of different devices having different network protocols, so uh, it's hard to make a solution that is able to support more than one or two protocols, and this is really an issue. Uh, Something else that needs to be considered is what language you're going to use for to write your applications. And of course, uh, the different operating systems out there that uh, exist. So in the end, because of these reasons, we're mostly seeing um, IoT solutions that are custom, that uh, lack flexibility, um, and generally um, lead to a vendor lock-in, which is something that companies or and organizations in general try to avoid for obvious reasons. Um, so uh, this is where EdgeX Foundry comes uh, into play. Um, EdgeX Foundry is a, a Linux Foundation uh, Edge project. Uh, it basically, its idea is to create a software framework, IoT software framework, that helps alleviate these exact problems that I stated earlier. Um, uh, the idea is to uh, enable an ecosystem of uh, interoper interoperable plug-and-play components. Uh, and basically, by doing so, it's going to unify the market in instead, of, instead of it being so fragmented and full of customized solutions. Uh, and it's going to accelerate the speed of IoT deployments, which is necessary in order uh, for IoT to really take off and uh, show its full potential in the world. So here I'm, I will show you some, some of the uh, Linux Foundation H Premium members. Uh, so as you can see, some uh, well-known companies are supporting th these uh, initiatives. Um, basically, a very like high-level uh, picture of what AJX is is something that's called a double transformation engine. What does that mean? Uh, now you have uh, on the bottom you have different devices with different protocols, and basically. Um, they're communicating with uh, something called device services, which, can, which you can consider like a device driver. Uh, they're turning the different protocols into one common AJAX uh, protocol, uh, which is used in the system. And then if you want to export that to the cloud, you can uh, translate it to whatever format you want. Um, yeah, so let's take a like, more detailed look. So this is um, the device service, devices and device service layer. So here, uh, as I've said, like, you have the problem that the devices speak different protocols. So uh, what uh, we're offering as uh, a way, as a solution, is to um, provide you with a device SDK, which device service SDK, which allows you to create your own uh, device service if no other service exists. The, the good, thing that, good thing is that uh, as time passes by, people are going to be creating more and more device services, which means that it will be possible for you to not even bother with this and just use a ready device service that is able to communicate with your device. But in case uh, this is not happening, uh, what you can do is uh, use the SDK to create your own device service. And basically, in it, uh, you're going to describe um, like 
the device, the um, protocol that your device is using, and all these different metadata that uh, will help the device service connect actually to the real physical device and communicate with it. Um, so the next layer is something that's called core services. Uh, I will tell you uh, a bit later why was the difference between core services and non-core services. Basically, uh, there are four of them. The first one is core data. Um, obviously, this is where the device-generated data is stored, and it has an API that exposes this to all the other services in, in AJAX. Uh, we have something that's called a command service, which basically um, helps you uh, make a device do something. For example, if it's a lamp, turn on, a switch on, switch off, uh, things like that. So m metadata is pretty self-explanatory. It just stores uh, some metadata about devices, device services that is used throughout AJAX. And registry and config is something um, that provides uh, vital things for a microservice architecture, like uh, service discovery, um, health checking, and um, it also has a uh, configuration uh, key value store. Mm, so this is um, um, actually something that I forgot to tell you is that this is called the southbound side. I mean, this is just a, for those of you that don't know, it's a terminology. So the devices and what is communicating with them is called the southbound. Uh, and now the northbound side is uh, communication with uh, other systems, uh, cloud providers, etc. So here, uh, up until um, the latest release, there were some export services that actually got replaced by something called uh, application services. And here, of course, there is an application SDK. So what is, what is the purpose of this application SDK and these application services? Basically, uh, you create a pipeline of functions that uh, are going to transform the data you wish to export in some ways. And after this pipeline is uh, completed and the, the data is transformed, you're then able to send it to uh, whatever you want, like cloud provider endpoint or uh, what you want. So as you can see on, on the both ends, north, northbound and southbound, we have SDKs that allow you to create uh, your own custom solutions, but these solutions, if you wish, can become part of the EdgeX uh, project and can be available to other people. Um, so they can use them in the future and uh, save some work. So this is the full picture of uh, the Ajax Foundry project. I intentionally uh, provided to you uh, the picture si uh, step by step because if you look at it uh, all at once, it can seem confusing and daunting. Um, as you can see, there's uh, things called support, supporting services and some additional services like security and management. Uh, the idea is that uh, we have a reference implementation of these services and we're uh, actively developing them, but the idea is that you can actually create your own services that would handle, for example, scheduling, uh, rules engine, alerts notifications, and stuff like that, uh, if you wish. But what is the core part of the project this, that is highlighted in purple? Um, yeah, so this is the distinction that I wanted to make. Uh, so we can also, uh, I can also show you on this diagram how the scenarios that I've been describing to you would work out. So the first scenario is if, uh, for example, you're having a device that um, um, uses a BACnet protocol, and for example, uh, in this example, um, this would need, uh, like, the device speaks to the BACnet uh, device service that we created, uh, then the device service since what data it has, now already in the common AJAX format, into the core data, where it can be stored uh, and exposed to, to other services. And uh, if you wish to export that, you're gonna go to an application service that you or somebody else has already developed. Uh, and this will then go to the cloud and you're, gonna, uh, you're going to have successfully exported your data. Now, if you want to um, invoke a command from somewhere outside AJAX, uh, what usually happens is that uh, you would use the command service. Of course, there is an API gateway, but this is not shown on, on this uh, picture. So 
you would go to the API gateway, which will go to the command service. And basically, the command service is going to go to the specific uh, devi uh, device service or device driver. Uh, and then it will directly communicate with the physical device in its native protocol. So this is like um, an overview of how things happen in EdgeX. So a few words on security. So the first three bullet points are just in general uh, for Edge, what like recommendations of what you should do. It's pretty like uh, common sense. So using TLS to talk to Edge in between services uh, by using X509 certificates and uh, having uh, encryption, encrypted data when you're saving it on disk. Uh, in terms of uh, Edge X and uh, what has been um, like propelled forward is um, in the in the current release uh, we're having um, finally PKI support for uh, communication uh, for for things that are outside AJAX that want to communicate with AJAX and of course uh, there is also. Um, certificates for uh, services when they're communicating with, with the API gateway. So the API gateway is sure that uh, it's communicating to a real device, uh, real EdgeX service and not some uh, imposter. And uh, what's, else, what's, uh, what's more is that there is now a database connection certificate, meaning that uh, like every service, when it wants to talk to its own database, it will require a, a certificate for that, um, which is trying to handle all like attack services uh, and avoid um, any security risks, uh, whatever possible. So, like the title of my presentation is uh, "Microservices at the Edge," so I'd like to speak about uh, microservices in general and. Uh, how like how this uh, comes into play in the edge. So here I've shown a pretty standard like um, comparison between monolithic uh, architecture and microservice architecture. Um, <clears throat> so as you can see, like going one by one uh, um, from these. Uh, so first of all, like monolithic, you have let's imagine that you have a big application that's complex that has a large code base. So you're gonna have this monolithic one big thing. Uh, if this, if it, w it was a microservice architecture, we're gonna have uh, like several smaller um, components of this big system. And actually what you're doing is you're turning your application into a distributed system. And uh, this has, of course, its pros and cons. Uh, so by separating them into smaller pieces, it's uh, easier to um, think about each individual piece and uh, discover and uh, fix bugs in it, and of course develop it. Um, that's also like <clears throat> easier for scaling things and actually some specific things, because if it's one big service, you cannot scale some part of it. Uh, if it's one big app like Monolithic, you cannot scale a particular particular part of it. So um, there are some problems, of course. One problem is. Uh, like distributed transactions, which is something that like cannot be done can be done to an extent, but not really. Uh, and when you make a comparison uh, in terms of uh, like network addresses, you're just uh, having one address if you're uh, using Monolith, and you're having a lot like maybe hundreds of addresses of services if you're using microservices. Um, of course, like the API endpoints, and uh, as I've said, because it's a distributed system, you're gonna use message passing uh, instead of like communicating via shared memory. Um, so in the end, <coughs> uh, the benefits of microservices, at least in my perspective, is that uh, when you separate your project into smaller pieces, it's easier for you to uh, understand it and develop it and uh, work on it. Um, it improves fault isolation, meaning that if a part of your application fails, it doesn't uh, require all of your application to fail. If you have a monolith and some part of the monolith fails, the whole 
application will fail. So this is how it improves that. Uh, and of course, it eliminates uh, vendor technology lock-in because you can uh, have different microservices implement different languages and you can use different databases. So it's much more flexible. And uh, one other big thing is agile application develop, uh, development and continuous deployment. Uh, since like for uh, on the management side of uh, software development is really important to be able uh, to release more frequently. Um, this is much done much easier uh, with uh, microservices than uh, in comparison to, to monoliths. So here is a like uh, some representation of an example microservice application. So as you can see, like uh, we have microservice A, uh, N, and X, uh, each with their own different database. Uh, so as you can see, so um, I'm not sure if I have, yeah, I have a laser. <laughs> so as you can see, here we have a, a, lab, a desk, desktop, a mobile, some kind of interface. And when they want to communicate, when people want to communicate with your application, they would have to go through to a gateway because uh, like, it's not really viable to, to connect directly to your microservices. Uh, and there are also some additional services that actually need to be there just uh, for your application to, to be able to function properly. So one is gateway, one, the other is registry, which saves the addresses of the different microservices. And for example, in the example here, we have a secret store which uh, has some uh, secrets in it. Uh, so, <clears throat> and here we can see some message bus if you want to use uh, asynchronous um, communication. So as you can see, um, microservices are great in providing more flexibility and making uh, Agile easier um, to happen and continuous development easier to happen, but they do come with a price and the price is these additional <clears throat> services that need, need to exist just for your application to be able to exist. And um, like these are all high, high availability services that need to be taken care of. So um, the point that I'm making is that uh, this is not a silver bullet. Uh, you should consider this when you're uh, having, uh, when you're making architectural decisions. But before you um, like get depressed because of that fact, uh, the good thing is that a lot of open source uh, technologies exist to handle uh, some of these uh, additional services that you need to develop, maintain, and uh, deploy. So for example, this is what we're using in AJAX. So as you can see for uh, <coughs> deployment, we're using Docker containers and uh, snaps. Uh, we're using for secret store uh, Vault, which is a HashiCorp uh, project. For service discovery, we're using console. Uh, for API gate, we're using Kong. <coughs> and of course, here we have Redis, MongoDB for databases and different languages and so on. <coughs> so, um, the history of the project and what is the future. So as you can see here, uh, it was started by Dell in 2015. It was proprietary. In 2017, they decided to open source it. And after that, like, uh, they've been trying to have two releases per year. Each release is, like, they have alphabetical releases, A, B, C. Uh, currently, we have Fuji release, which was released actually last week. It's really fresh. <laughs> uh, so, as you can see uh, on the slide, the new things about Fuji is like improved security. Um, <clears throat> the new ap application SDK that I told you about for exporting into the northbound, and um, some new device services, and of course uh, a CLI, which actually I've been uh, involved with uh, directly. <clears throat> so what ha what's coming up next? So the next release is going to be called. Uh, Geneva, um, he, it, it is um, expected to uh, happen on, in spring 2020. Um, basically, what's gonna be improved is uh, the third party service uh, certification. What does that mean? Well, remember that I told you that we're uh, the non-core services, we have a reference implementation for them, but 
you can uh, provide your own implementation. So in case you want to provide your own uh, implementation, uh, like what we need to do is uh, allow you to uh, use this, the certificates infrastructure that we currently have in terms of security. Uh, something else is platform set up uh, guidance uh, relative to AJAX performance measures. So basically what, does, what, does, what that means is that um, like we're going to have a more extensive suite of performance tests that are going to be able uh, to answer the questions. For example, will AJAX run on the device I have? Um, what is the maximum amount of speed I can reach? Um, like discover some bottlenecks and stuff like that, which is the next important step in the evolution of, uh, of the project. Uh, actually, I forgot to mention that um, the Edinburgh release was, uh, as you can see here, was the first um, stable release uh, 1.0. Uh, it's actually available and Fuji are available as uh, Docker containers and snaps if you want to like experiment with it, play with it, um, and try it out. And uh, going back to the what's new in the Geneva release is the high availability concerns. So currently, um, not much work is completed on that. Of course, this is something that needs to happen, but it is planned to, to happen in the foreseeable, in the near future. Okay, so here um, I have some references for you. So basically, AJAX Foundry is, uh, although we have companies that have employees directly involved, such as VMware and uh, Intel and Dell, uh, anyone can join and contribute. Uh, it's what they call like uh, technological meritocracy, uh, meaning that as long as you're contributing good stuff, uh, you're welcome. <laughs> So, um, as you can see, the code is uh, in this GitHub repo. You can check it out. There is a wiki explaining uh, in more details about Ajax Foundry, how to get started. Uh, there's a Slack channel. And uh, there are some, uh, like the project is split in different work groups. So, for example, one group is uh, tackling application uh, services for exporting. The other is tackling device services. Uh, Core, core services and so on. So again, like uh, super easy to, to get involved. They have uh, meetings, I think every week and they even have recordings of those meetings. So that's it for my presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions we have time?